Happy Friday and good morning, everybody. Trevor Hall here with Mining Stock Daily in this week's long form episode. Uh, back home for a great couple of days in Toronto for the PDAC conference. Great to see as many people as I could. I know that place is busy and there's a lot of people I did not see, but I hope everybody returned home safely. We got a long form episode. We're going to spend more time talking about the macro events, including interest rate cycle expectations. And also a little bit about regional bank concerns with our friend Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. That takes a full hour time to get a long list. And we're going to talk about this move in gold. I asked Jim about this move in gold over the last few days and where it is coming from. There's still a lot of speculation about really what's spurring this. Was it is there fundamental reasons or is it mainly just a, a technical move here on the chart? So a lot from Jim. And we also talk a little bit of Bitcoin. Got to talk a little bit of Bitcoin with Mr. Bianco as well. Special thank you to Arizona Sonoran Copper, Fireweed Metals, Victoria Gold, and Visa Silver for their continued support of the podcast. Let's jump into my conversation with Jim Bianco. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Be well. The last time we spoke with Jim Bianco, I think it was back in Beaver Creek during the Global Macro Conference with MI2. Uh, so that was the first time he'd been on the podcast. So I reached out to Jim to come back onto Mining Stock Daily to talk all things macro. He is the uh, the man in the myth for Marquette via Chicago. <laughs> Jim, how you doing? I'm doing good. I was in Milwaukee yesterday for the big uh, Marquette-UConn game, and unfortunately Marquette came up a little bit short. Oh, it's too bad. Uh, and uh, there's some hope for the world. I tweeted this out a little while ago. <laughs> I saw this. Yeah. yeah. Matt, Matt LaFleur is the uh, Packers head coach, and Matt Eberflus is the Bears head coach. And they were sitting next to each other during the game. Look, you get those two guys to break uh, peace, you know, maybe Middle East peace, or we can end partisanship. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I could get my wife to agree with me. Oh, okay, maybe I'm just, now I'm being a little bit too optimistic, right? <laughs> well, hey, my uh, my Nebraska Cornhuskers for the seventh time, I think it was the seventh time in school history, won 20 games. Uh, they can't win a game on the road. That's that's the problem. But uh, they're shooting some light, lights at basketball. It's uh, yeah, very. They, they, they have well. been. I'm a big college. I'm a big college basketball fan, and they they have been. They have been doing very well. Maybe we could get their coach to sit down with the Oklahoma coach once at a, at a sporting event. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. All right. Well, let's yeah. talk. Let's talk about some markets. I mean, there's a number of interesting headlines that's kind of popped up here uh, in the last week or so here, Jim. But I do want to talk about somewhat about you know the interest rate expectations. We entered 2024 uh, with complete spread between market expectations and based on the Fed dot plot. You know, back in January, we were expecting. Or the Fed was telling us three rate cuts throughout 2024. The the market had it at six. I mean, that was a huge spread. And then ever since then, the last three months, Jim, we've seen the you know uh, uh, the Fed's Federal Reserve people kind of start walking that back a little bit. In fact, uh, Bostic came out this week, and he's even saying just one, and then a pause. And so they're really retreating on this. And why would that? Why would they be completely like kind of? Slowly, slowly walking backwards through the front door. I think the simple answer to answer the last part first is the economic data is okay. There isn't a problem. We are cranking out jobs. We are cranking out GDP. And if you look at the last inflation report, we're cranking out prices too, or, or inflation. Yeah. Now, what I mean by cranking out inflation, just to be clear, it's really looking like it's bottoming. And it's bottoming at three. It's not bottoming at two. And so I think Jay, Jay Powell has it right. I got my finger or my thumb here ready to hit the button to cut as soon as I get some good weak data to tell me to cut. And there isn't any. So he just keeps waiting and waiting. <coughs> and the concern is, well, not the concern. I mean, we want good data, but you're not going to get the rate cut unless you get weak data. And we're not getting that weak data. So we've seen this for the last year or so. A year ago, we were talking about recession, and then we were talking about soft landing. Uh, we were talking about the last mile and in inflation to go from three to two. I mean, I'll sum it up for you. Um, none of these forecasts at Wall Street um, has been saying have ever been correct. There's never been a soft landing. Um, of course, Wall Street loves to forecast the soft landing because uh, soft landing has no definition. 
So mm. I could say, look, there's a soft landing. And in a year, I will define it and tell you I was right. And that's kind of the way <laughs> Wall Street loves the soft landing. Um, so the economy continues to go along and inflation continues to be bottoming. And you're right. In January, not only do we have six rate cuts priced in, at one point on January 12th, we had seven priced in. <laughs> and now we've got Every three priced in for the rest of the year. A yeah. quick last thought for you on this. Um, does everybody forget that in 2021, the Fed was saying that inflation was transitory? And did everybody forget that in January of 22, they said they were going to raise rates three times? And they wound up, you know, three times would be 325 basis point moves. And then in February of 2022, Jamie Dimon shocked the world by saying, I think they could raise rates six times. Oh, that's just Jamie saying stuff to get attention. They raised rates 22 times in 22 is what they wound up doing. The Fed puts out these dot charts and then six or 10 or six or 12 months later, they bear no reality to whatever has happened. That has happened continuously. And yet it seems like that's fallen down the memory hole. Oh, no, no. Jay said he's going to cut three times. There will be three rate cuts. He says this kind of stuff, all, not him personally, but the Fed through the dot chart says this stuff all the time. We're going to raise rates. We're going to lower rates. We're going to hold them steady. And then they wind up not doing that a lot. So if we wind up with no rate cuts, it's just par for the course for what we've seen with the Fed. And to be fair to the Fed, it's about predicting the future. They have a certain set of assumptions on the data they think they're going to see. And they don't see that data come in the way they do. And they adjust the policy accordingly, which is fine. And we should all understand that. But this all of a sudden, like I said, we've all memory hold their history and said, no, when he when they put out the dot chart in December and it said three rate cuts, it was as if they already did it. And that's kind of the right. way that we've been reacting about it. Yeah. Oh, I mean, not just I mean, the market has been reacting about that. It is screaming new all time highs. And obviously those few mag seven stocks continue to pull up uh, the nasdaq by its bootstraps alone even you can say even just a couple um but i, I you know the, you know the, we, i'll give you a quick i'll give you a quick stat about that you know okay uh the 10-year yield hit five percent in in the end of october that was 19 weeks ago the the s p 500 unless there's some kind of a huge reversal on the payroll report on friday march 8th which is the day after we're recording it's going to be 17 of 19 weeks that the stock market has been up. And that's one of the mm -hmm. big best strings that it has had in its 100-year history of the uh, S&P. And what's been driving this is this whole idea that the Fed is going to offer interest rate relief to the market. right? And right. they've really just bought into this whole narrative. And of course, to get that interest rate relief, you actually need weak data. Yeah. Well, this interest interest rate relief, it, it's it's going to be the way they've have offered it to the market is almost a little bit of like a sugaring of it. And I, and I had this conversation in Toronto on a panel on uh, Sunday afternoon because we were talking about supposedly rate cutting cycles. And I said, listen, like the Fed says three and they're starting to walk that back. But even if you, they do give us a full three rate cuts through 2024, it's going to be what, maybe a quarter point here quarter point there so that takes it from what five and a quarter to four and a half i mean is that really that meaningful to the market that little bit um yeah first of all i'm i'm of the opinion and claudia some economist gave me a great line that the fed is political but not partisan and what that mm. means is that they don't sit around the fomc meeting going Donald Trump said that if he's elected president, he's going to not reappoint Jay Powell. We like Jay. So what policies can we enact to get Joe Biden elected or if they want a Trump elected? No, they don't. They don't think about it in those terms. So they're not partisan, but they are political. And what I mean by political is I've been saying it's been May. It's we'll assume that they're not going to cut rates at the main at the March meeting. So it becomes May, June or bust. You, uh, do they either cut rates at the May meeting? They cut rates at the June meeting. And right now, as we're talking, the May meeting is priced out a rate cut. So it comes down to the June 12th meeting. Do they cut rates at that meeting or not? If they don't cut rates at that meeting, the next meeting is July 31st. That is between the Republican and Democrat conventions. <laughs> then they become political, not partisan. The Fed, what does the Fed want during an election year? They don't want to be part of the narrative. They don't want, ever want their name mentioned. 
And for them to change policy between the convention or the meeting after that, September 18th, change policy a couple of weeks before the election, change policy, they become part of the narrative. They become part of the outcome of the election and they don't want to do that. So that's why I said it's either May, June or bust, bust meaning that you won't get your first cut if you get it until after the election. May is already priced out. We'll see what happens with the payroll report on Friday, March 8th, mm-hmm. <laughs> to see if that changes that equation. June is pricing a cut, but it's only at around 65%. And so that could easily go to 100 if we get a very weak payroll report, or it could go under 50 and then pretty much blow up the whole year. So I tend to think that the Fed will not change policy in June, in, at the July or September meeting. Now, let me be clear. They will continue a policy. Their policy right now is hold. They'll continue hold. If they start cutting rates before the July meeting, they could cut rates in the July meeting because it's a continuation of the existing policy. They just don't change the policy that close to an election. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned inflation bottoming. I mean, could you make the argument that inflation, if it is bottoming, might peak its head back around? I mean, this last CPI report came in a little bit hotter than usual. And I ask you this because back in September when you and I first chatted, I mean, you were uh, very bearish bonds. And, and, you know, since then, I mean, that call hasn't necessarily been correct, but it also hasn't necessarily been terribly wrong either. Uh, so tell me about, you know, that inflation expectations off this bottom and what that means for interest rates for the rest of 2024 into 2025. So I look back and uh, when we talked in September, the 10 year yield was at 4.2%. Uh, and then it went to five, and then it went to three seventy eight, and now it's at four point two, four point one two percent. So it's only eight basis <laughs> so point difference. Yeah, it's been a it's been a big wild roller coaster ride to pretty much yeah. where we started. Is what is is what that um, is where is where that it went. I am still bearish on bonds, and the reason I am bearish on bonds is because I am bullish on the economy, and I am bullish on inflation. Now, specifically to your inflation talk. Um, mm-hmm. I th- see there's a couple of ways I'm going to answer this question. I'll answer the question conceptually and then technically. Conceptually, there is something that very few people are talking about right now. Um, and that is there is a massive divergence underway be- in the global economy. The day we're recording, Christine Lagarde came out and had her press conference for the ECB. And they have pretty much communicated that they're going to cut rates in their June meeting. And that this is at the same time that Paul is testifying that he's waiting for the data to give him room to cut rates. The European economy is in recession. The UK has had two consecutive negative quarters. Uh, Germany has had two consecutive negative quarters. You've had a contraction for the whole Eurozone, and then the other quarter was zero. So you came as close as you could to a technical recession in Europe. Canada's had a negative quarter of growth in the third quarter. And you've had two consecutive quarters of negative growth in Japan. But in the U.S., you had booming growth, 4%, 4 4.9% in the third quarter, 3.3% in the fourth quarter. Now, I've looked back, and I can't find another period where you've had above average growth for two consecutive quarters in the U.S. At the same time, you had Germany, the U.K., and Japan have consecutive neg contracting quarters of GDP growth when we're growing above trend. And to throw in there, Canada had a negative quarter and the whole Eurozone had a negative quarter. Global synchronized growth is no more. So that's really the biggest story that we're talking about. Now, why is global synchronized yeah. growth no more? And when I look at the data, something interesting has been happening in the U.S., and not happening in Europe. <clears throat> First of all, just so everybody understands what I'm about to say, after every financial crisis and every recession, when you come out of it, the economy changes. Change does not mean dystopian. Change does not mean worse. So I'm not saying it's gotten worse. I'm saying it changed. And coming out of this, re- uh, out of out of the 2020 lockdown shutdown, what we're seeing is consumer spending. The percent that we, personal consumption of uh, percentages of GDP and the U.S. savings rate, the U.S. savings rate is falling. It is down to 4% average over the last two years when during the post-crisis period from 2010 to 2020, it averaged 
We used to spend, personal consumption used to make 67% of GDP. It's now 69%. So let me bottom line it for you. Coming out of the recession, uh, out of the lockdown, we're just spending money. We are spending money. And I'm not talking about because the inflation rate's up. I'm saying we're buying more units of stuff. We are buying Mm -hmm. stuff. The early sign of this was in late 2020, when the government was mailing out stimulus checks. What did we do with those stimulus checks? You would have thought we were going to pile them all in the treasury bills and we were going to cower in the corner hoping that the financial crisis doesn't collapse. No, we bought GameStop. We bought options. We speculated on Reddit. That was your first sign that this cycle was different. I, whether it's PTSD because of the lockdowns or a change in attitude, people are just saying, damn it, I'm going to spend money. I'm going to spend money and I'm going to enjoy my life. David Kelly is a strategist, very good strategist at JP Morgan, gave a presentation a couple of weeks ago and he, he, he acknowledged that people are spending like drunken sailors. And he said, what are they going to do when they're 61? And I muttered, I was in the crowd, I muttered under my breath, they're going to worry about it when they're 60. Now, this is very different than coming out of 2008. After 2008, we were really worried about the health of the financial system. <clears throat> we were really worried about our financial position. So when markets started to recover in 10, 11, and 12, and keep the example simple, and your brokerage statement went up and made more money, what did you do? You just felt better. Oh, thank right. God, my nest egg is a little bit bigger. But now when your brokerage statement goes up, it's we're going to Italy. We're going to buy a new car. <laughs> and and this is why the economy is staying stronger than we think. And I didn't even get to the d- large budget deficits. When you run budget deficits of this magnitude, it's almost impossible to have a slowdown or a recession. And <laughs> what you can have is, re- is inflation. And that's what I think we're, we're ultimately getting. So all of this spending is really what's driving it. And it's spending, it's, you know, we used to joke that after the financial crisis, the spending was S&P 500 inflation, right? No one wanted to buy stuff. They wanted to make sure that they had wealth and they just kept plowing it back into financial markets. And we had S&P 500 inflation. But now that they're getting some wealth, they're spending more of it on CPI stuff. So we're getting a little bit more CPI inflation Mm -hmm. or PCE inflation, if you want to call it that. And that's why I think that the inflation rate is bottoming and it's going to move up. That's the conceptual answer. Oh, and the final thought, this is not happening in Europe. They are not spending more money in Europe. This is why I like to say, if you look at Wall Street's forecast, Anna Wong, who's the chief economist of Bloomberg, has been since October of 22 has had a model that said 100% recession in 12 months. Now, that's been 17 months, and it's been at 100% recession probability in the next 12 months. And a lot of other people are predicting recession or serious downturn. They got it right everywhere but the U.S. Mm -hmm. The difference is they didn't factor in that coming after every financial crisis, something changes. After every recession, something changes. What's changed now is we're spending more. And because we're spending more, that's leading to stronger growth and more inflation. They're not doing that in Europe, and that's why they're struggling. How long are they going to spend more? As long as the cycle is. Look, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing this until the next downturn, and then we'll assess what's going to happen in the next downturn, and then we'll change again and come out of that. And you may assume, the last thought for you, you may assume that, well, in the next downturn, they'll stop spending. Not necessarily. Why are they spending now? Because to be blunt about it, when the shit hit the fan in 2020, what did, they, what did we do? We mailed, them thousands, we mailed everybody thousands of dollars is what we did. And so they said, damn, why am I bother saving money? I, I'll spend money right. and I'm going to enjoy myself. Well, what happens when the shit hits the fan again? I'll take a slow walk to the mailbox. And eventually, if it's not today, it'll be tomorrow. There'll be a big fat check in the mailbox. And, that, and are they wrong for thinking that? It worked no. for them the last time. And so yeah. that's why I think we've got more spending. And that's why they didn't largely do that in Europe. Now, they always mail them checks in Europe because they're more socialist. But they didn't, change the, they didn't change their trajectory as much as we did. And that's why we have a change of behavior. And that's why I think that ultimately it will lead to higher nominal growth led by higher levels of inflation, which is why I'm bearish on bonds. That higher nominal growth will keep pushing up interest rates. Yeah. Jim, I, I, that great 
Great rundown here. And I do want to piggyback on this because I remember back in <coughs> September, you kind of broke down the what your thoughts were on how you, Americans were going to be working differently, the work from home culture. And that's why you were very bearish commercial real estate and basically mom and pop shops. Uh, because of that, for, for many reasons, I'd highly recommend going back to that interview you and I did uh, from Beaver Creek and listen to that as set it up. But to follow up, I mean, let's get let, let's also kind of bring this back into the loop. Currently, the Jolts report highlighted a workforce like uh, fewer job openings, lower employee turnover. They said the great resignation has turned into the big stay. And so to, to piggyback on what you had just said, it almost seems people after they kind of moved around, they got settled, they found a position, work from home or do whatever they need. They're kind of settled and that's happened over the last six to eight months. And so if you feel more comfortable with your position, with your with your career, you're more likely to take that cash and again, buy stuff that actually, you know, the tangible things, not just by uh, Tesla calls. So, you know, how does that, does that, are, are we starting to see that change just kind of settle and be accepted all over? Yeah, I think we're starting to see that too. You're right. Um, Nick Bloom at Stanford University, he's done probably this. Uh, he's he's an interesting guy. He's been studying work from home for 20 years. And he said, you know, up until two years ago, I had this obscure little topic I was uh, studying and now it's the most important topic in the world. Um, and, and he put out a report earlier in the week. And he said in 2019, they did some surveys. In 2019, the average employee lived, or excuse me, let me back up. The employee hired in 2019 lived on average nine miles from the office. In 2023, they lived 34 miles from the office. And what he meant was, it's a remote work world. I'm hiring mm -hmm. people. Now, how'd you get to 34 miles? It's not that everybody lives in the outer suburbs. It's that you're hiring people that live hundreds of miles away in other cities. And that's how your average went out to 34. And his point was, that's why we can't go back to the office because people don't live where the office is anymore. You can't get them back to the office anytime soon. So that is part of this change that we've seen. And you're right. The reason I bring that up is what the jolts, the job opening labor turnover report shows. If you're of a certain age, you may remember the newspaper wanted ads index. Uh, <laughs> we don't use those anymore. And so we created the jolts report to replace it. So that's essentially what it is. Um, with a lot more detail. <clears throat> but what it's basically showing you is we had a big giant churn in the labor force. That churn is slowing down. It's the great stay. But if you combine it with, with um, Bloom's statistic about 35 miles, this is the new world we live in. And it also feeds into the consumption patterns too. As um, I like to say, prior to the pandemic, and everybody worked in the office five days a week. You were home two days, Saturday and Sunday. Now the average, the average workforce is in the office three days a week. So you're home Saturday, Sunday, probably Monday and Friday, and you're in the office Tuesday, Thursday. That means you've doubled the amount of time you're at home. That means your consumption basket's changed, and most likely you're buying more goods. And that's mm -hmm. why I think we've seen an uptick in, in overall consumption and an uptick in goods, and why we've seen such inflation over the last three or four years. And that is going to continue. And that's why I think that the inflation rate is going to stay high. And it's all part and parcel with this whole uh, remote work thing. And this whole remote yeah. work thing just highlights the attitude change. And that 35 mile statistic, I, I throw that out to people because people always go, well, they're going to go back to the office. They're going to go back to the office. No, they can't. They can't. They live two states away. You, you know, they, you, they could quit or you could fire them, but you can't demand that they show up Monday through Friday. Yeah. This is also reflecting in the services industry a little bit, Jim, and I maybe a little bit of anecdotal story here, but, you know, back in, in university days, we had what we called Thursday Thursdays, you know, so we'd go out to the bars on a Thursday night because, you know, Fridays were usually a little bit slower. So you, you know, you were young and stupid, you could afford to do that. Um, 
you know, fast I'm forward. I'm chuckling because we're all remembering those days. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> it's full nostalgia here on the podcast. Right, uh, right, but, right, right. Yeah. At, at, at our age, at, at our age right now, if we did that, we'll need basically two days to recover in a day and a half of traction. But That's ahead. right. Absolutely. <laughs> so la- this this last uh, late fall, I'm in London and and I'm, I'm meeting a couple of friends in Soho for for some pints, and it's a Thursday night, and we leave we leave the pub. And so the streets of Soho are absolutely wild, like packed. And I was like, what is, is there like a festival or something going on? What is happening? They're like, no, most people work from home on Fridays. And so they go out and they have a good time Thursday night, knowing that they don't have to get up and get themselves ready and commute into the office Friday morning. And so that is reflected. I mean, I do think that is reflected in the in the services, the food and beverage industry as well. I mean, they're getting a little bit extra leverage here with that move because people, like you said, feel okay to go out and spend a little bit extra money and more time in those areas. Right, and and it's showing up finally, showing up in you know um, office real estate market. You know, we're starting mm-hmm. to see a revaluation of the office real estate market. We're starting to see the small and regional banks were uh, struggling. It's because there was always this big hope of RTL return to office. And I think that in the last six months, pretty much since we talked after we talked in Beaver Creek, that <clears throat> the reality came in, they're not coming back. And no. the reality has come in, there's too much office space in central cities right now. You know, midtown Manhattan. There are lots of empty floors. Uh, there is empty buildings. And they're going to stay that way. And we don't know exactly what to do with all this empty space right now. Um, it's not, you know, there's a whole host of problems with making it residential. It's, it's very expensive. So that's really not a realistic option. Um, you know, and so we're going to have to figure out, it's almost like a cultural thing. Um, what is the purpose of a central business district? Well, it used to be because that was the only place you could do your job and everybody had to go pack into these big office towers to do their job. Well, they're still going to go there because collaboration is important, but we're not going to need as much real estate as we needed before. And that's why the vacancy rates are going up. Even the retail storefront vacancy rates um, in central business districts are going up as well. And so This isn't going to change. And I think this has finally been the cold slap in the face to both real estate investors and the banking system. You got a bunch of bad debt here and Mm -hmm. it's not going to, you know, and everybody's not going to get on the subway and go back into those buildings and magically make your bad debt good debt. It's just not going to happen. Well, you mentioned you mentioned banks and you mentioned bad debts. Maybe this is a great time to talk about New York Community Bank. Uh, I one I landed in Toronto last night, and then I I got the news uh, that NYCB, which is down I think eighty percent on the year, uh, got a lifeline here, uh, restructured a little bit, four hundred fifty million dollars from Liberty Strategic Capital. Uh, that was that's Steve Mnuchin's old fund. Uh, Hudson Bay comes in for two hundred fifty million. Reverence comes in for two hundred million. And there's uh, another one hundred fifty million from uh, from others. Uh, so you're, they're getting us, I, I guess, maybe we'll see if how much of a steal this is, but obviously it does provide a lifeline for regional banks. The feds did not come in uh, and have their hands on this. At least that's what the cover looks like of this story, Jim. I have a hard time believing that there wasn't some say by the uh, by Janet Yellen and the, the Federal Reserve. But let's talk about this You mean that the, the current <laughs> Treasury Secretary didn't talk to the former sec- Treasury Secretary yeah. about this Shocker. at all? Yeah, no yeah. way. There's no way that could have happened. Uh, but you know, it's you know, it's it's an interesting, it's an interesting situation because the last time we had regional bank fallout, they came in and insured every single deposit to the penny. Uh, this right. is a this this is a private deal, so this changes a changes a few things. And are you watching this news? I mean, I, I still like I said eight months ago during the Silicon Valley bank, I said I don't think this is the end of it, and I will say that again. I don't think this is the end of it. Right. I mean, what I think is most interesting about this news is that the stock is was down 80%. I'm, 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 don't take me literally on this. Take me figuratively on this. The stock was down 80% yesterday that, this, that they were hiring an investment banker to raise equity. 
And then overnight we get a de- we get news of a deal, and the stock went from being down eighty percent to being down seventy eight percent. You know, so it, <laughs> right, it, right. It, it bounced, but you know, it didn't really like the world is saved kind of bounced. Now part of that could be because here's how these deals work: we'll give you four hundred fifty, we'll give you a hundred million, we'll give you a hundred million, but we got two weeks to go through the books, and mm-hmm. we could go through the books for two weeks and in ten days say, "Holy shit, I didn't know this. I'm out." You know, and stuff. So there's always that. You know, until they actually cash the check. It's, you know, it, a commitment is nice, but it's not the final end of the deal. And I'm not saying that they will back out, but we've seen this, you know, before with, with all of these um, shaky kind of deals. <laughs> well, you know, and you could argue that, you know, the banking system is still problematic. But here's what's different about this one. 70% of commercial real estate lending in the United States is done by small and regional banks. And, you know, so this is not JP Morgan, B of A, um, right. you know, Citibank or Wells. Those are the four largest banks, which about 80% of the assets or thereabouts. <clears throat> it's not them that is really, it's really struggling. They're not in that business. It's the other 4,000 banks. They're in the business of commercial real estate, especially the smaller, the smaller banks as you go down the list. New York Community Bank is not a very big bank. It's only about $70 billion. And then they they acquired Signature Bank, which was one of the banks that blew up last year. So there's some really, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> jinxed assets now. They failed. They're failed now twice, those assets. Right, in the, right. Well, New York Community Bank hasn't failed, but failed once and almost failed a second time. <laughs> so I think that as this financial crisis really starts to unfold, it is going to be in the small and community bank area with this commercial real estate. It's not going to be in the large bank area. The concern, of course, I think that they have is the contagion effect that it could have on all these banks that people wind up. And the contagion effect is not necessarily that people, you know, bail on, you know, you know, your local bank with their deposit ba- with their deposit base. Um, and, you know, move on to a, a chase branch or put it in a money market fund. But we wipe out the st- we wipe out like the KRE regional bank index and we wipe it out so bad that all of these regional banks are all suffering because mm-hmm. some of these banks have trouble. So this is interesting one that it is all the small and regional banks. It is not Chase. It is not City. It is not Wells. And it is not B of A. Do you think this news and maybe this could, uh, the the headlines of regional banks keep on keeping on popping up in the news has any uh, leverage or pull with the Federal Reserve's rate cut narrative? Do you think they care about a lot of these regional banks? There's just not <laughs> hasn't been enough yet for them to really pull the trigger on interest rate moves just based on them. Um, first of all, they do care about the banks a lot. They're, they're, they're a regulator of the banks. Sure. Um, but, uh, I think what the fed would say is Michael Barr, who's the vice chairman and the head of supervision, you're in charge of this bank problem. This has no bearing on federal reserve policy because they would turn around and say, all right, let's cut interest rates, 200 basis points right now. What have we done for community bank? Nothing. Nothing is what we've done for them if we cut interest rates 200 basis points. So I don't think that this is going to play. I think what they're going to do is they're going to look at, do we need new lending facilities? Do we need to ease regulations? Do we need to impose new regulations? And uh, that's where the Fed is thinking about this. Because we tend to forget the Fed is also a banking regulator and a big one too. And that's the way that they're going to address it. And they're going to do it with the FDIC. And the OCC, the Office of Control of Currencies, and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, who are the other two big federal banking regulators, they're all going to get together, and that's how they're going to deal with this problem. Yeah, I, you know, it, it just the, the I, I guess I don't know if I expect contagion. I wouldn't be surprised to see it, but it has kind of been a slow-moving freight train. But even with you know this news out of New York Community Bank, I just come I, I come back to my mind is like I just don't think. Even if NYCB were to fail, if Mnuchin and team found something they didn't like in two weeks and said, deals off the table and this bank actually failed, I just don't think it's I, I, I don't think it's enough for the Federal Reserve to have as much concern that it would actually move them into, you know, one or two rate cuts uh, sooner. Maybe that July cut, right? Like as you were mentioning. 
I, I don't right. think if there's 4,000 banks, what's one down the drain? <laughs> or two or five. I mean, yeah. look, last, <laughs> last fall, I mean, a year ago, almost a year ago to the week, is we got Silvergate, we got <clears throat> Signature Bank, we got Silicon Valley Bank, bam, 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 almost one after the other, three days in a row, $400 billion of assets. You all failed. New York Community Bank, 70. Um, and then a month later, we got Republic Bank, which was over $100 billion. We had PacWest merge. We had a lot of these other big, big regionals, um, you know, make a lot of movement. What did the Fed do in the wake of that? They hiked. They hiked two weeks after Silicon Valley Bank failed, and they hiked again um, after that. So, and they dealt with it with the BTFP, the Bank Term Funding Program. They dealt with it with uh, regul on the regulatory side of the equation. They didn't feel like they needed to deal with it on interest rates. So, no, uh, I would say if you want a simple answer is, you know, watch if, if the contagion gets to the point where the stock market's tanking on the news, then the Fed might think about doing something. The contagion mm -hmm. is at the point where the stock market's up another 1% at a new all-time high. Goodbye, banks. We're not going to do anything. You know, it, it talk, talk, you know, talk to the regulator. I'm sorry, but it's not going to change policy. Yeah, I mean, the the VIX has tried to climb over 15, uh, you know, for the last number of weeks and just cannot even do it. I mean, there is no volatility. So, but I, I agree with you. I mean, the the market, but it has been, it's been doing this for so long, for three years. It's just been shaking off bad news. The only mm -hmm. thing that's got it, the only thing that's really got its volatility up is the, the fears of a rate hike, you know, and obviously that's unknown. So. Yeah, they're, 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 we're not we're not there <clears throat> on the fears of a rate hike, at least not yet. Yeah, yeah. I got to ask you about a, a a couple monetary assets here. Uh, I know you follow the Bitcoin uh, yeah. market closely. Uh, you also follow the gold market, but not as much as Bitcoin. I mean, Jim, I, I don't. Maybe you noticed a lot of people are keeping pretty quiet, but gold made a new all time high. It continues. Oh, to I've, lose noticed. Strength. <laughs> I, I've noticed. I've noticed. I've noticed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, let's talk. Let's talk about let's talk about gold. I think a lot of people listening are going to want to know why this is happening. I'm in Toronto at this mining conference, and gold's making this move, and it almost seems like a general technical move off this squeeze that we were at around two thousand dollars an ounce. It got squeezed enough to where it was going to be a powerful move one way or up, and here we're at. I mean, is there a fundamental? Like, are you seeing any fundamental fundamental reasons? why gold would be putting in such a move here in the last four days? Uh, the simple answer is no. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, here's, what, here's what I see. I see. I see the flows into all the gold ETFs peaked in October of 2020 and, if, and there's been consistently getting outflows for three and a half years. So the primary vehicle for retail to play in the gold market has been a net seller. And we got a new all-time high. I talked earlier about how the U.S. economy is staying stronger and the Fed is going to hold and the ECB is going to cut and they might be in recession in the rest of Europe and in Japan and in at least a contracting quarter in Canada. And all of that, you sum all that up, and that is stronger dollar. And a stronger dollar is what we've seen so far this year. That should be bearish for gold. And it's making a new all-time high. Um, we see crypto. We'll talk about that next. Um, you know, the the argument is is that the the retail public and everybody's lost their interest in gold and their fancy is turning towards cryptocurrencies, so it's sucking money out of the gold market. And with Bitcoin at a new all time high or right at a new all time high, it should really be sucking money out of gold, and it's at a new all time high. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All the traditional things you would look at are really saying gold should be selling off, and yet gold is going up. And so it is perplexing, I guess. You know, you could go down further and, and look at jewelry demand, or you could look at central bank demand, or you could look at foreign warehouse receipt demand. You could look at supply. You could look at what production is and all of that. But I haven't gone to that level deeply. But again, mm -hmm. I don't think any of that data say, oh, yeah, gold should be going right now. But nevertheless, it is. And that's why I said 
it's perplexing that this is the set of circumstances. It's almost a mirror image of what we had four years ago. Because <clears throat> I remember if you were asking me four years ago, I was saying gold is the most frustrating asset I've ever seen. We shut down the, we've shut down the global economy. We're mailing people money. We're running huge budget deficits. We're worried the world's going to turn into a zombie apocalypse. Why isn't it at $3,000? It's mm -hmm. basically what I was asking four years ago. And it didn't do anything during that. And now it's finally starting to move four years later on a bunch of stuff that suggests that it should be going lower. Maybe we got all our indicators backwards. I don't know if, <laughs> if, if that's the answer or not. But like I said, the, the, the simple answer is I don't have an answer for you as to why gold is going. It's just all those indicators that I just pointed out are not suggesting it. Well, what's really fascinating about this move, I mean, if uh, in, in, in any other cycle, you know, if you go back to 2010, 2011, when gold made that huge all time high, but, you know, relatively back then, I mean, you were seeing this, those little tickers on the bottom of financial TV networks talking about gold making new highs, and it was taking a lot of interest. But at the same time, now can, I, can making... I interject too? Sure, Wasn't that right. also that 2010, 2011 rally too? Um, you know, you know, you definitely know you've got speculative interest, you know, running, you know, frothing at the mouth because yeah. silver was going ballistic then too. Yeah. I mean, it was being, you know, that's when you know that you've really got cheap, well, you know, small time retail going crazy into it when they're starting to buy silver. Yeah, and, and, but we're not we're not necessarily seeing that. I mean, the no, only people not. screaming from the mountaintops are the typical people like myself who've been invested in this metal for quite a long time and see the value in it. But it, it, so it, it's interesting, just as an asset class, you see an asset that makes a new all time high, and it's still being subdued in the general dialogue at the time because Nvidia is making a gazillion dollar market cap. Uh, you know, Nasdaq's moving. Wait, Bitcoin's wait, you mean moving. it only felt the video <laughs> fell to a gazillion? I thought it was infinity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I mean, so a lot of people are still just generally more interested in this continued narrative of the tech stocks. And so <laughs> it's not getting that gold and precious metals are not getting, uh, you know, I guess the love I would say it deserves right now. And maybe a, a conversation about why this is all happening. But isn't that in general like a pretty good sign? you know, for the long term. Yeah, so when well, yeah, the... I mean, the bull market climbs a wall of worry. That's always a good sign, right? You know, as I'd like to say, if, if gold is perplexing, and I was going to say this, if gold is perplexing and the indicators are saying it shouldn't go up, it will climb a wall of worry. It will continue to go higher and higher and higher until such time that it is completely obvious why it's going up, and then that's the peak. So as long yeah. as we're, it's not completely obvious why it's going up, it will probably continue to go higher. At, at this okay. point. All right. Tell me about Bitcoin, Jim. Oh, now I'm going to have to go into witness protection if you get me on this <laughs> subject as well. <clears throat> Why? What's, what's going on here? I mean, we had a bunch of ETFs. Uh, I'm having a fight. I'm having a fight with the maxis on social media, the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin maximalists on social media, because <laughs> I, I'm not giving 100% fealty to these ETFs. Uh, uh, okay. And they're missing, my, they're missing my larger point. I have two larger, I have a couple of larger points. Um, the larger point, number one, what is the purpose? By the way, you're talking to a guy who's long-term bull on, on cryptocurrencies. I do mm. believe the narrative in the long-term potential. Keyword is potential. So first of all, what is the long-term long bull story on cryptocurrencies? Well, over the last 15 years, we've gotten many of them, right? It's a store of wealth. It's going to be through DeFi, a new financial system, through Ethereum. It's going to be the new world computer network. It's going to be the leading edge of Web3. It's going to be the beginnings of the metaverse. You know, we throw all of these kind of narratives out, these bigger picture that it's part of a bigger whole. Mm -hmm. What is the narrative now that's got crypto, or, uh, that's got Bitcoin at an all-time high? It's number go up. It's that we opened up a bunch of ETFs and everybody's just plowing, mindlessly plowing money into this and there isn't enough coins to go around. And it's a greater fool theory that we're pushing it higher. So what's the point of this thing? Is the point number go up? Is that the only point that we've got right now with it? The other problem I have with the cryptocurrency, uh, with the ETFs on cryptocurrencies is, I think it represents failure. What are you talking about? The price is up 50%. How can it be expecting failure? For 15 years, you have told us that the current financial system is at risk. We need a hard money 
digital currency like uh, Bitcoin, we need to self custody it in digital wallets outside of the financial system that are permissionless and can't mm. be censored. And we just threw that all out the window, the hell with it. Let's just put, list it on the New York Stock Exchange. Let Gary Gensler bless everything that we do. And all we give a shit about is number go up. And so mm. that's the other problem that I see with it. And the third problem that I've argued is I don't, you know, I, look, full disclosure, I actually do run an ETF. It's a very small one. It's a long only fixed income ETF. My wife is a partner in an ETF company. So I know a little about the ETF industry. I'm not suggesting I'm a, the, the, the big expert on it, but um, I've, I'm close to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, what I see happening with these ETFs is I've said, I think to put it in th these terms, this is a bunch of speculative money that's coming in. And that's fine. Speculative money could come in and speculative money can push the price up. But to use the term, I fear that they're weak handed. What does weak handed mean? We're buying, we're buying, we're buying because the price is going up. What happens when the price peaks and goes down? There's going to be this headlong rush out and its sell off is going to turn into a rout. Um, it, oh, but that happened on Tuesday. It sold off for five hours. Look, it's going to take more than five hours of a sell off in order to. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> to turn the table. And so I said, be careful what you're wishing for, uh, you know, that it's going to be speculative money. And their comeback from everybody in the industry, from all higher ups on down, you don't know what you're talking about. This is boomers through their wealth managers putting money into the Bitcoin because they have to. And I was like, okay, let me insult you by giving you some reality here. <laughs> a boomer that uses a wealth manager is rich. So why does he use a wealth manager? What is the wealth manager's number one job? Not to make him poor. If the, you know, you're telling me that a guy that is driving his Porsche to his lake house, talking to his wife about the first class tickets for the spring break to the Turks and Caicos is worried that he doesn't own enough Bitcoin. He don't give a shit. He just right. wants his wealth manager to not make him poor. So who is buying this stuff? As I like to say to these guys, you are poor people that want to be rich. That's who's buying this. That's why I said it's a bunch of weak-handed hope money that is coming into this thing. And it's not the Greenwich Country Club is all getting all agog about Bitcoin and rushing into it. Look, at the Greenwich Country Club, they're not getting themselves worked up about Bitcoin. And they're not getting themselves worked up about NVIDIA because they already have it. They just don't, and their wealth manager's mandate is don't make me poor. And putting me into very speculative investments like that could make me poor. Oh, but they'll put 1% of it in there. Mm -hmm. They don't have time to worry about 1% of their investments. They're on their way to the Turks and Caicos. You know, and so that's, and so, and, and wealth managers are by very nature, very, very conservative. And they're not looking to, you know, riverboat gamble with 1% of your money. Yeah, so they're probably more, just, they're probably more like sorry they're probably more likely to buy the two year yield at five percent. Absolutely, and that's what we've been seeing. We've been seeing tremendous yeah. inflows into bond funds, and these same crypto guys go, "Why would anybody buy a bond fund?" Well, first of all, because it has a yield. Second of all, because they're already rich, and this is something that will continue to give them a return and keep them rich. Again, mm -hmm. I don't go, I don't go to a wealth manager and say. Here's, here's my little sum of money I have, but we're going to put it on red or black so that I can become a millionaire. It's not how it works with a wealth manager. You do that yourself is what you wind up doing. You go to a wealth manager and say, I am wealthy. Don't make me poor. And that does not mean, oh, well, then we got to put you in the Bitcoin ETF, you know, if you don't <laughs> want to be poor. It, it doesn't work yeah. that way. It's what I'm yeah, trying to say. Neither are they buying junior minor equities either. I will say that on right. the other end of the you spectrum. Know, it, you know, yeah. for the same reason, the, the, exactly. the same reason, you know, and most of these wealth managers, and now I'm not trying to disparage the wealth managers, believe me, I'm not trying to disparage the wealth management community, but they play it safe. What do they wind up doing? They say, okay, we have, we've, based on my experience and our models and all of our experts, here's what we'll do. We'll put 60% of your money in the S&P 500 fund. And we'll put 40% of your money in a, in a broad-based bond fund. And mm -hmm. no one gets in trouble for that. And no yeah. one becomes poor because they've got 60% in a broad-based index of stocks and 40% in a broad-based index of bonds. It's when you start doing this other racy stuff that the guy mm -hmm. says, look, 
I told you I don't want to be poor. I didn't tell you I want you to make me rich. I already made myself rich. That's how I got to this point that I gave you my money. I just don't want you to make me poor. And that's yeah. the part I think they've, that they're all convinced it's rich boomers rushing into this stuff. It isn't rich boomers rushing into this stuff. I think it's more weaker handed speculative money. And, the, and fine, the price is going up on weaker handed speculative money. But the next downturn, that weaker handed speculative money could head for the exits. And the last thought I would give you, this is a digital asset that trades on the blockchain. And these are, these are um, um, ETFs that buy and sell the actual Bitcoins themselves. What I'm also afraid of, and we've seen this with, I'll throw out some names that you maybe remember this, XIV, which was the short volatility fund that fell 95% a day. And the USO, which was the United States oil ETF that wound up driving the nearby, the front month of the WTI to minus $40. When you get these structures that are somewhat incompatible with the underlying market, and there's two examples of it, you could get ridiculous outsized moves and, and you know just dysfunctional markets that come out of that. Those were two examples. We haven't had that yet in Bitcoin. But what I'm afraid of is that will be coming if we're not careful with what's happening with these ETFs in the underlying markets. Look, all these ETFs, use Coinbase as their custodian to buy and sell the underlying coins. And in the last couple of weeks, Coinbase's computers have been failing them because they can't keep up with the demand. Um, you know, and so we'll see. We'll see. Now, I, now that I've said that, whenever any of the Bitcoin maxis hear me, I will definitely be in witness protection. So well, well, I will talk to you. Well, not too many of them. Yeah, I'll talk to you again. From an undis I'll, I'll talk to you okay. again with a disguise and an undis like the mafia bo uh, informant with a disguise from an undisclosed location. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, you know, obviously we're not crypto experts by any means on this show, but I do, you know, watching the market and leading up to those, the approval of those ETFs, my first initial thought was, do we really need 12 of these crypto Bitcoin ETFs? It seems like it's already oversaturated. It just seems like quite a bit right out of the gate. The yeah, second but that's thought just, was, can, well, I, can I answer that? Yeah, 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 yeah two, I'm going to answer it two ways. That's just market capitalism. You know, yeah, the market sure. will shake that out. And aren't there 10, you know, gold ETFs? Why do we need no, any probably. more? Than, yeah. Why do we need yeah. anything more than, um, you know, um, was it IAU and GLD? That's all we really yeah, need. Yeah. That's, no, that's 80% that... of the assets anyway. Sure. It's fair between enough. those two. Yeah. Sure. Fair enough. I totally get it. Uh, but mm -hmm. the other thought was, you know, like, the the reason why Bitcoin or the narrative behind any asset is whatever people want to make it to be. And it wasn't that long ago where the, the Bitcoin maximalists were like, it's deregulated, it's off the system, like it, it's all on the blockchain, the, the, the government can have its hands on it. And then all of a sudden it changed like, yeah, we do want them to, we do want this to be regulated because we want the ETF. So it is like whatever narrative right. it sounds like you want it to be at the time you are going to get. So let me give you the narrative that got me bullish about this system. It has nothing to do with the United States. It has to do with 2 billion people around the world. I'm talking about Southern Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, mm -hmm. that live in countries with, with shaky currencies, shaky local currencies, and corrupt banking systems. And they have no way to basically you know, uh, save. Their banking systems are corrupt. And then their countries, their governments devalue whatever savings that they have left. Now, I will grant you in the United States and in Europe, we have more, relatively speaking, uh, to Venezuela, if you want to think of an example, yeah. we have a rock hard currency versus Venezuela, and we have a very trustworthy financial system. Trustworthy in that I put my money in the, in the bank and I don't worry that you know somebody's going to steal it from me. And I don't worry that the dollar's going to get hyperinflated into nothing like you do in Venezuela. So I looked at cryptocurrencies and the original thought was, look, the US and Europe had 150 years to bring that system to the rest of the world and they didn't do it and they're never going to do it. That the, uh, there, there's, there's 2 billion people out there that need an alternative financial system and one that has got a hard cap so that their governments can't screw around with it and one that is permissionless and decentralized so that their corrupt politicians and bankers in those countries can't steal it from them. Totally on board with that. That is 
the that is the narrative that is the objective. If we're just screaming about number go up in a bunch of Bitcoin ETFs in the United States, what are we doing to achieve that objective? Nothing. We're doing nothing to achieve that objective. And that's what's got me kind of down on the whole concept. I Look, I, I get the prices going up, but if you want mm -hmm. to achieve that alternate, because if you don't achieve that alternate financial system, what is the purpose of this? Other than it's a trading sardine that we're just going to trade up and down that has no purpose. Uh, and that's, so I still think there's a purpose out there. And for brevity's sake, I will say there has been a lot of people that are trying to bring that vision that I described. For instance, I'll just give you one statistic. Over half the people in Brazil in the last year have used a stable coin, a blockchain stable coin, to buy something. So mm -hmm. it, it is happening in some of those places. But is this Bitcoin ETF, is this going to further that along? And I'm afraid the answer is no. I would hope to be wrong on that. Well, and to piggyback on that idea, it, there's a lot of people in the precious metals that will, you know, hoard physical metals thinking when Armageddon comes, that's the only way that they're going to be able to buy things is by taking their silver dollars and buying ammunition, you know, and, and I just, you know, I, I, I personally sit this like fine line where I totally understand the insurance policy, uh, why you'd want to own something against a falling currency or concerns about stability of, of, of a country's debt. But at the same time, I do not think, you know, I'm not going to be, I don't think we're ever going to be carrying around one ounce gold coins to be purchasing things. I do think it's a, it's a, it's a quit. It, it, there is liquidity in that. There is an insurance aspect to it. There is safety within the precious metals. I just don't see the tangible use of it unless again, like I was saying, we're fighting off zombies and need, need guns. Right. <laughs> and so one other thought for you too, in the poor countries, the poor countries of the world, what do 80% of them have? A mobile phone. Mm -hmm. If you go to a refugee camp in Africa, you will probably find at least half those people have a mobile phone. And that's like the only thing that they have. So the idea of a electronic wallet that is permissionless and decentralized, that they, they could take some of their wealth and hold it in that electronic wallet, and all they have to do is charge their mobile phone and they can get at it, is something that has the appeal and it's portable and it's protected because you've got your, you know, you've got your password on it and it, it can't really be hacked. In a, in a quick word on this idea, M-Pesa is the mobile phone is, uh, I'm sorry, Safari.com is the mobile phone company in Kenya. They brought up a program about 15 years ago called M-Pesa. And what they said was everybody in Kenya down to the subsistent farmer that's pushing a plowshare behind an ox has a mobile phone. And what M-Pesa is, is you, when you pay your mobile phone bill, if you pay a little bit extra, you can have a balance in your mobile phone bill, even if it's a few dollars. And you could text that to another mobile phone. And these people use it to, t to complete transactions. Two guys with oxen and plowshares can buy and sell, you know, commodities with each other, you know, a couple of, a, a sack a week by paying for their phone. Uh, a wife could could uh, send fifty cents fifty cents to the bus company in in, in Mobasa, so somebody could take a bus ride home, so her husband could take a bus ride home. Right. And the World Bank did a study of all of the programs to lift poor people out of wealth, and that M-Pesa program was voted or deemed to be the most effective way to get poor people out of wealth. They could store their money, they can use their money, they can, and it's frictionless and it's cost free. And that's wow. what this could bring to the rest of the world if we stop trying to degen the price to $100,000 through ETFs and get about that mission. That's what I still hope we're going to do in the cryptocurrency space, which is why I'm positive on it in the long run. But that I just see this as being kind of just taking us away from that mission. Yeah. Well, that was just the the longest conversation about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies we've had on this this podcast <laughs> for a very long time. Jim, I've taken up a lot of your time. Thanks so much for 
joining us this morning. And I, I do hope that the weather continues to stay mild for you in Chicago. Although I would, I expect you as much as I, I think it's probably going to snow at least once or twice before we actually get out of this, out of this mild. Yeah, spring. I know it's in the, it's in the sixties and seventies in March in Chicago and I'm enjoying it, but I also not putting my snow shovel away. You're all yeah. correct. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jim. Hey, thanks so much for your time. We'll touch base again, uh, maybe later this year. Thank you.